Step into the kaleidoscope universe of Chantel Martin, where every line and color tells a story of resilience and artistic brilliance. Unveil the layers of her personal struggles, intertwined with profound discussions on pressing matters, as she opens up about her artistic evolution and the profound introspection that fuels her work. It's time to dive in. Good morning, Chantel. How are you? Good morning. Just enjoying the nice weather here in Los Angeles. What about you? I know. Yeah, we're super jealous of you because here in Texas is 107, and it has been for the last 35 days. Wow. So, yeah, good for you. What do you do in LA? Um, I moved here recently, actually. So um, May, I think maybe March or May, I forget which month, but a few months ago I moved here officially. So after 15 years in New York, I decided to try something a little bit different, but not too different. But actually, I think L.A. is quite different. So, yeah, I live here. Why L.A.? I wanted to go to a different city and I didn't want to really start all over again. You know, I've done that many times in my life. And I'd been to L.A. many, many times. I never thought I was an L.A. person. But in the end, you know, I ended up quite liking it on the last couple of visits that I came out. So I've, I just decided to give it a chance and... I think like a lot of people who first moved to LA, I'm right near the beach. So, so that's good. So I'm, I'm happy. I can walk along the beach in the morning instead of when I'm in New York, you know, you're out late every night, you wake up late, then you jump into meetings and then you repeat that. And then you do that so much that you don't even remember all the things that you're doing. So I'm definitely happy to have like a slower pace of life right now. And I make my own granola. I'm working out. I'm going to bed at a decent time. All you the healthy full emerge. Things. You fully yeah, emerge in exactly. that California lifestyle. <laughs> exactly. So how do you feel like that change has improved? I mean, you're talking about quality of life in general, but has improved uh, your work or what are you trying to accomplish at this point in life? have making yeah. this big change after being in New York for so many years? I think I'm just trying to accomplish just living life a little bit more. I was doing that before, but I think subconsciously you end up on a little bit of a hamster wheel. You're living in New York, you run across the road and then you, you think, why am I running? Or you wake up every morning, there's construction, but actually there's construction here in LA too. But, um, you know, I think you just end up on this kind of, conveyor belt of just doing things and going out and kind of connecting with people but never really connecting with them fully because it's only so brief these moments that you spend with people and I just really wanted to have a slower pace of life where it's not all about my work it's kind of about just life and doing things and um, being healthy and and you know LA is a very good facilitator of that. Do you think that's coming more with maturity, being able to have to accomplish so much with work and get in a certain point in your life that you want to kind of not slow down, but have space to get better perspective instead of just always chasing the next thing? I think my work is less of a priority now. I know I'm a, inherently a creative person and my goal throughout all of my life is essentially to be able to have a space to work, you know, to be able to have my own little space where I can create things and make things and share things. And I have that, you know, and I think I've had that for a long time, but I've also been caught up with trying to do things at a bigger scale or trying to, you know, um, just push myself and challenge myself. And I've been doing that for really a long time. And now I think I can challenge myself in a different way. And, you know, I've reached a lot of goals. You know, I've had multiple museum shows. I've, I've, um, had positions at MIT, NYU, Columbia, you know, I've choreographed a ballet, I did a TED talk, I've released a monograph, you know, I have a pretty a, a impressive resume, so to speak, and I've ticked off a lot of my things on my list. And so I think having a change of goal or perspective is really nice to see now what do I focus on. And the artwork or the projects I'm focusing on now are more about experiences and connecting. And I've started to do performances here in my studio in LA and typically on a Monday every Monday or every other Monday I invite people to my studio and I have a performance piece called present word where I take words from the audience and with them and in collaboration with them I live compose a 
piece of music and also, you know, kind of like a spoken word piece, but it's not spoken word in the traditional sense. It's, it's more, it's more like drawing with words. And now I've also started to have peop other people perform in my studio in that space. And, and that films that see sees and feels like a really connective and positive way to express myself right now. That's fascinating because a lot of times artists is very private with their own method and how they like to work on their process. You seem to be really open up to strangers and people to come in and be part of the process. Tell me a little bit about how this idea came about and how were you hesitant in the beginning? Is it meeting your expectations or surpassing them where you hope this project would accomplish? Yeah, I think I've never been private with my process. If anyone spoke to me or known me over the years, I've always been very open with my process. From when I lived in Japan back in the early 2000s, I was a VJ, a visual jockey, and I would create visuals to DJs and dancers and musicians. And people would write to me on VJ forums and ask me about my process and, and what mixes and uh, software I was using. And I would explain everything I was doing and show them how to do it. And then when I moved to New York, you know, I, I'd be drawing live. And as I'm actually drawing live in front of an audience, I would explain my process. And so I'm a big advocate in exposing the process. And I don't think you lose any magic when you do that. It's quite the contrary. When you expose the process and you invite people into that process, you create a, a bigger bridge of connection and experience between the creator and the audience. Also, it's, it's quite interesting the amount of artists that probably at certain stages in their life don't make their work or they have a team of people that make it. And, and I think there's, you know, there's, that's been a tradition for a very long time of having craftsmen and women make the work of an artist, but I think it's not as transparent as it used to be. I think people kind of hide behind doors to do that and they made this idea of the process something that's very elusive and, and very... Uh, exclusive and something that should be kept a secret. But I think it's quite the opposite. You know, we, we should showcase that and explore that more. And I've always been using my voice as a tool from public speaking. And then in New York, probably 10 years ago, I did start to do performances. And I performed at a few different venues, Rockwood Music Hall, which is a, it's been around for many, many years, it's kind of an underground music venue and lots of people have played there for the last few decades. And I performed there probably 10 years ago, a few times. And then later on, I, I created a one woman show, which I performed at Sotheby's and Fotografiska and, you know, all of these interesting places, 368, all these really interesting places in New York. And then the pandemic happened. So this kind of one woman show that I was workshopping and, and hoping to take to a theater, to a stage, you know, that kind of put a spanner in the works and then I stopped doing that. And then fast forward, now I'm in New York. I'm not as focused on this one woman show as a whole, which had these different chapters about my life and drawing and music. And I'm just in a way taking one chapter of that, the music chapter, and exploring and developing and evolving that. And, and my goal with that is to eventually work up towards having a band and we're very sonic, it's kind of spiritual, but not in the cheesy sense. It's, in, mm. it's more process-based. Uh, it's more about being in the moment, but creating with the interaction of the audience. So we're not there doing our own thing. It is about interacting and feeding off that atmosphere that is in the room with you. How often do you find yourself, because your work is very much very personal, as you mentioned, very much about you and your history, your story, everything that you're doing. And as we evolve as a person, you find yourself rethinking your thoughts, rethinking the things that you thought you understood. It's more so of rediscovering your thoughts. I think mm. we naively sometimes as people think that we're, evolving in our thoughts of what our core questions or are or our core themes but when i look back at my work i find things or questions in my past writings or even past drawings that i'm thinking or asking now and it's always a surprise when 
you write something out, you have this really prolific question and you say, oh my God, this is such an amazing question that I've never asked myself. And then I find a, a diary or a notebook from 20 years ago and there's the exact same question. And so I think us as a core, we have these fundamental questions inside us and, and it's almost like those questions are on repeat and we're trying to ask, ask them and answer them in different ways. Are you, when are you asking them, are you searching for a defined answer? Are you searching for a feeling? What, what, what would it be like a, um, the, res the ideal response you get it from that journey? I think the answer we're trying to find is just a path. It's a way. So I don't necessarily think in my instance, personally, I'm looking for an answer, but I'm looking for a way I'm looking for a process. I'm looking for a bridge. I'm looking for somewhere where I can walk from one way to another because results have never really been important to me, but how you get there is. And I think that's quite similar in the questions that I ask. You know, I ask these questions, but I don't actually want answers from them. I just want to find ways to explore them and discover them and pick them apart and experiment them and question them. Talking about path, you have had an extraordinary life so far. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the beginning? I mean, how it was like for you growing up in London? I believe you're the oldest of six kids. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah oldest you know. of six. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I grew up in, in southeast London in this area called Thamesmead, Abbey Wood. And it's funny, actually, they just got the Elizabeth line that goes to Abbey Wood now. So now they're, it's a part of London that was, you know, it's on the outskirts, it's zone four, but now it's very much connected to the rest of London. Um, but yeah, I grew up there in the early 80s, oldest of six kids. Uh, it was an interesting experience growing up because at that time, the area that I was growing up in was very, very white, very racist, very homophobic not a lot of exposure to people from other places. And I, you know, my brothers and sisters are, we have a different dad, so they're blonde and blue eyed. And I was uh, literally kind of the black sheep of the family. Mm -hmm. And I experienced that every time I left the house, you know, I would get treated differently and have a different experience because people bring to you their baggage. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I remember, when I was at art school, so, you know, probably 20 something years later, you know, I was at art school and I went home to visit my mum and my sisters and there was a girl screaming outside that there was a black girl going into the house. Like, I think it was one of my sister's friends. And she's like, you know, Lisa, there's a black girl going in your house. And this girl was so terrified that like someone like me was walking into the house. And my sister was just like, where? Like, where is this threat? Where is this black person? Mm -hmm. And then the girl pointed at me and my sister was like, oh, that's my sister, Chantel. Like, she's not black. Like, um, and it's so interesting, just those two girls around the same age having the same experience of me walking into a house had two completely different reactions based on what they were brought up with, you know? And it's like, my sister's grown up with me as me being her sister. So she just saw me as Chantelle, where this other girl saw me as a threat. And, and I think, you know, I, I tell that story because it, it shines a little bit of a light on the experience that I had as a young person every day when I would walk out of my house or go to school and people would ask me why I was that color and, you know, where I came from, or people would tell me to go home to my own country and, and, you know, so there was that side of things. Um, there was also a positive side of things. You know, I had a, a nice group of friends and we all hung out and, you know, climbed up on the buildings that we grew up in and um, would go to the adventure playground and ride bikes and play Sega Mega Drive and stuff like that. So, you know, there was also kind of the friendships that we had where you'd go and knock on people's doors and ask them if they want to come out and play. Um, but it was also kind of a, a, a tough place to grow up because, you know, people didn't really have a lot. And I think in general, there was a lot of drugs and alcohol in the area. Um, but, you know, I think in a way, I'm grateful for that experience of growing up somewhere like that. It's given me a lot of perspective of what it is to think and um, 
to think in different ways and to understand things from different perspectives and to see what it is to grow up in places where there's a lack of exposure or there's a lack of exposure to different people or experiences or places. It's interesting because I think when people think of London, they immediately think about a very diverse, big city, but you still find the spots there, not so much, it's all about exposure as well. But you mentioned at one point in listening to you that you felt you didn't feel comfortable there anymore. London wasn't for you at one point in life and you wanted to explore more and you ended up going to Japan. So what was the thought process of that? Because talking about a, a city that for sure is a lot more diverse than Japan and, than Japan, and they show up in a country that you don't speak the language, culturally is completely different than what you haven't exposed in the last few years. But here you are trying something new. Yeah, and I would just, you know, to your point on when people think of London as somewhere that's very diverse, I think we have to be, you know, kind of mindful when we think it's diverse and there's lots of different cultures, we have to look at where those cultures are and if they're integrating or if they're mixed kind of as a whole. And if you look at London, you have your Indian populations, you know, you have your <clears throat> kind of African populations. Everyone is in their own segments or in their own kind of neighborhoods because that's how they feel safe. They feel safe in their own pockets around their own culture. So it's not very diverse if everyone is living in their own pockets and they're not mixing and integrating into everyone else's culture um, and backgrounds. And, and so, you know, I think that's just something to keep in mind. But yeah, so, so, so growing up there, um, I in a way had a passport, you know, my passport in life was not fitting in. It was looking very different from everyone around me. It was not, um, you know, not feeling like I fitted in as a whole. And I think we've all had this experience, especially if you're creative on some level where there's something different about you. It might be how you look, it might be what mm -hmm. you listen to, it might be your sexuality. There might be something uniquely different about you that makes you stand out. And I think a lot of us have experienced this in different ways. And at first, when you're young, you want to fit in, you know, you want to be like everyone else. Um, but because I, I really couldn't fit in because I just didn't look like anyone, um, you know, you have that choice of try and really assimilate or just really be an individual. And so that was my first passport in life that allowed me to think that maybe there's a world outside. And, you know, in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, we're not on Facebook. We're not on Instagram. We don't have smartphones. So seeing and finding options of other places was more of an, uh, an, an imaginative exercise versus you Googling something and saying, I want to go there. And so I, in 1999, I went to art school for the first time. And that's when I met people from all different countries, different cities, different backgrounds, different races. And it taught me this power of, of being unique and being an individual. And, and for the first time, that being celebra celebrated versus um, being looked down upon. And I met some friends or some students that became friends from Japan. And Tokyo seemed like it was on the other side of the planet because literally it was. And so I set my goals on, OK, I want to go to that place. That place sounds like it's so far away that I can't even imagine what they eat there, what they do there, what it looks like. I have no idea. And that's where I want to go. And so through the whole course of my kind of art school, it was me with the goal of moving to Japan. And in that time, I happened to visit Japan for a vacation for a month. And that changed my life in a sense, because I went to this place where I clearly wasn't Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, I was clearly an outsider, but that was okay because I wasn't born there. I didn't grow up there. I wasn't raised there. And so when people ask me, Doko kara kemashita, like, where are you from? I would just say London. And they would say, oh, okay, that's great. And there that's was no, that. and there was, yeah, exactly. That's that. And there was no weird undertone or judgment on your class or your race or your background or the part of the country that you were from which would happen in England, it was just simply like, oh, that's cool. And, 
uh, what I really liked in Japan, in, in a way, is that you're Nihonjin or you're Gaijin. You're Japanese or you're a foreigner. That's it. Obviously, there's different nuances to that, but I wasn't trying to be Japanese. I was just trying to be myself. And I also didn't bring any of that baggage from the UK. You know, when you're living in a place that you're growing up or you're surrounded by family or friends or people that know you, you live up to certain stereotypes or projections that people are projecting onto you of who they think that you are. You know, we all have certain personalities in our friend groups or um, certain family expectations of who they think we are and they project them onto us. And when you go to somewhere completely new where you don't understand the food, the language, the transportation, anything like that, it's totally a blank canvas for yourself to figure out who you are as a human. And I'm so grateful that I moved to Japan in a time where we weren't online and where we weren't on Facebook and where those judgments and stereotypes and projections weren't carried in my iPhone or my phone, you know, across the, the oceans. It was literally me just showing up, being completely isolated and then having that blank canvas to try and figure out who I was and who I am. Did you have an original plan? How long are you going to stay? Where do you stay? Like, we're more like... Yeah, more so, so I went first, you know, there's many different teaching programs. Uh, I forget what they're all called now, but, you know, I think there's the JET program and then you have all these different Eikaiwa, which means like school, like English language schools. Um, and so I went with a, a, an English language school in the middle of the country in Nagoya in a, in a city called Komakishi. And... I had the expectation to go to Japan for one year. Let me go to Japan for one year and then I'll come back. You know, this gives me one year to think about things, to have this experience, and then I can come back. And then you get there and it's so difficult because you don't know what you're eating. You don't know the language. You can't even read train station names. You get on a train and you don't even know where to get off because it's all the train station names are in kanji and you can't read this language. And you go to the supermarket to buy food and all the packaging is very different. You don't even know what you're buying or eating. <laughs> so, so after a year, you know what you're eating. And after a year, you know what trains to get on. And after a year, you start to make some friends. And so one year didn't seem like enough. And then after two years, you speak a little Japanese. And after two years, you have some hobbies. And after two years... Uh, you know, you, you've navigated things a little bit better. And so two years isn't enough. And then after three years, you're like, wait, I can speak Japanese and I want to utilize this. And, and so fast forward on, I ended up being there five years. I woke up one day after five years of living in Japan. I had no idea I'd lived there that long. And it's interesting because five years felt like a lifetime. It felt so long and it felt like I missed so many marriages and births and birthdays and... I woke up one day after five years of living in Japan and I was like, okay, I'm ready to leave. And I just had this sense that I needed to leave before I started disliking Japan. Um, mm. I think I've always described, not always, but later I described Japan as this really beautiful cake. You know, imagine you have this beautiful cake with all this beautiful ice in and on on that cake you're one of those little icing people you know you're like one of those little people standing on the cake and there's all these candles and decorations on the cake and the longer you're there the more you start to sink into the cake and then you're like oh this cake is a little bit gooey and mm. a little bit dark and a little bit yucky so you have the chance to kind of stay there and keep sinking and and having better knowledge of this place or you can just be naive and go back to the cake and be like, oh, it's so pretty here. Look at all these pretty lights and all this pretty icing. And so I wanted to have that experience continue of looking at Japan as just this pretty place with all these, you know, pretty decorations and, and icing. Um, and so, so I, I made the, uh, you know, I made the kind of plans to start thinking about leaving. And, and I, and I did, I, I met some people from America in Tokyo and I realized that Americans weren't that bad after all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they have a little bit of a stereotype in England. Um, yes. When I was growing up, I don't know if that's changed or not, but 
um, yeah, I met some Americans and I was like, oh, they're actually quite nice. And they invited me to come and visit them in, in Boston and New York. And I did. And I think anyone that goes to New York for a vacation, you say, oh, I love this place. It's amazing. Um, and then you move there and then you're like, oh, crap, what did I do? It's not the same when you actually live here. But um, but yeah, long story short, um, after five years in Japan, not knowing how long I would be there and kind of really live in this alternative life, I woke up one day and, and I left. And it's really interesting when I meet people who lived in Japan f- around the same time and for the same length of time, because we have this very unique shared experience of knowing what it was like to be a foreigner in Japan at that time, mm-hmm. you know, before things were really in English and before people would speak to you and before there was that many foreigners there. I think we had a really unique experience of living in this place that was so different to where we came from. Um, But then, you know, you're kind of popped back into the Western world, so to speak. And it's almost like that didn't exist in a way, or it's a little bit of a dream um, or just just something that no one else really knows about. So it's always so refreshing when I meet someone that's like, oh, I lived in Japan for 10 years or 15 years at this time, um, because we know what it is to be a foreigner in that place at that time. It's such a unique experience. During that time, those five years, I mean, as you mentioned, it is an evolution every year. You feel more confident, you enjoy yourself more, but how are you um, crafting your your creativity, your work? How that evolving at that point in time? I wouldn't use the word crafting, more just experiencing. I've always found that my work is a reflection of where I'm at and what I'm doing. And so at that time of living in Japan, I'm making friends. In a way, I've almost put the idea of being an artist on the shelf. You know, I, I, I graduated from Central St. Martin's and Art School in London. Uh, I got a first class honors, which is meant to be like the best thing. But then you realize kind of getting a job from there in the arts isn't as easy as they make it sound, because especially in somewhere like the UK, um, at the time when I graduated, maybe this has changed, I don't know. Um, It's very hard to break into the art world there because it's it's, uh, a very exclusive place that uh, has very narrow paths for you to enter into. And so when I did move to Japan, I never even imagined I would be an artist. It wasn't something that I would think about or even hoped to be but I've always been someone that I'm going to be making things wherever I am like I'm just inherently a creative person who wants to make things that wants to collaborate that wants to um to experience things through a creative mind and when I moved to Japan I was going out dancing a lot uh I was clubbing I was going to all these big uh clubs but then also going to these weirdo avant-garde spaces where people were making their own instruments and circuit bending and live coding and so I was kind of in these two different worlds where one was very experimental and avant-garde and one was very commercial and and like the big club scenes and I would spend hours and hours going to these clubs dancing or experiencing uh, music and and thought that hey I want to do the visuals for this like this is what I I draw I should be able to do this And long story short, I ended up being a VJ, a visual jockey. So doing live drawn digital visuals to DJs, dancers, musicians. And I loved it because it's it's almost like that was the most tangible thing. I I love drawing. I love mark making. I love collaborating. And here were these musicians or these spaces that were providing this music but also I think Japan culturally is um, a very visual country. You know, they're very culturally used to visuals and animations everywhere, unlike kind of like the Western world. <clears throat> and so every time you went out to, even if, we're, if it was a tiny, tiny little bar or space, there'll be monitors or a projection screen. And so I imagined my work on those screens and then through through time it started to happen and then I ended up not just going out and dancing I would be going out and doing the visuals and then dancing or going to an avant-garde space and drawing physically and having that projected and then going out after that and and so I think I created in that way 
And I ended up on that path because that was just what I was surrounded by. And when I start to look back over my career, the work that I've created is a result of what I've been surrounded by. You know, it's a result of my environment versus me thinking about things I want to create in an isolated way and then going out and creating them. You know, if I look at my work in New York, you know, I took over the screens of World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. I worked with the New York City Ballet and took over their promenade at Lincoln Center, took over the screens of Times Square. But these are things that I would walk past every day and imagine my work on them. And so it's not that dissimilar to the way that I was working in Japan, where you see these things and you imagine your work on them or you imagine what you could do in those spaces and then somehow over time, you plant the seeds to try and make those things happen. Um, it's so I think in that way, I'm very um, not clued in, but I'm going to make the most with what I'm surrounded by and what I have. I believe I have access to because of my imagination is imagining that I can have access to it. Now, this is fascinating because many artists, as anyone who has a goal, can imagine themselves and see themselves in a position that they want to achieve. As you were able to imagine your work in those big screens in those places in the cities that you were living in. And then you mentioned about I, was, I started planting the seeds. And I think that's where I'm interested. What, tell me a little bit about that process when you can visualize your work, you know what it's going to look like, you put the energy out there to manifest it, but then you have to do the work. Right, you have to make sure that that tr becomes something beyond just imagination. How do we do that? How do you do that for you? Because you have been able to do this over and over and over again. It's just, I, it's manifesting and it's a mixture of manifesting, which is basically a lot of hard work, a lot of imagination. Um, you know, it's, it's the same thing as a, a little kid from where I was from. I'm from a family that no one's ever finished school. No one's ever left the country before. No one's ever traveled. But then I heard of this place called Japan and I thought I'm going to go there. Um, and then I moved to New York and, you know, I'm broke sleeping on my friend's sofa, blah, blah, blah. But I see these things around me and I'm like, I want to do those things. I'm going to make it happen. And then it's just, you know, I think often, you know, there's, you, you meet people where we know that we're kind of like the hardest working people in the room, you know, because of where we're from and what we've had to do or the amount of work that we've had to do um, to, to, to even be where we are. And I think, you know, something like the Times Square screens, you kind of like build up to it. Okay, so I want to work on these screens. I got to start working on screens again, you know, so and then screens or opportunities with visuals or screens start to come your way because you're like seeking it out in a way and or you're taking advantage of those types of opportunities that come your way or you're creating your own opportunities and and, and something I've said for a long time is don't play the if game you know when I first moved to New York I played the if game like if I had money if I had a studio if I had a gallery if I had a manager if I had an agent if I had all these things, I could do all the things that I would want to do, but I had none of those things. So how can you still create? And you have to create by seeing what you have access to, seeing uh, who you have access to, seeing what you have access to and starting there. And that's how you plant seeds. You plant seeds with what you have, not what you don't have. And then from there, you simply put one foot in front of the other. And I know that just sounds very abstract, but it just means that you keep moving and pushing forward in the direction that you want to be going in, no matter how long it takes to get there. And I think in today's society, especially now with social media and everything online, is that we think that we should have things very quickly or that they should come to us very easy. Um, and I think that takes away from the sense of really growing and evolving and progressing as a human and feeling like you deserve those things so that when those things come to you you've you've learned all these lessons you've grown as an individual and you've you've kind of planted those seeds to get there over time so i think to answer your question to to summarize the answer is is when you want these things that seem that they're very far out of your reach you set that intention and you put one foot in front of the other in that direction and you use what you have access to as you're moving in that direction 
And as you're doing that, you're trying to progress and get a little bit better and a little bit closer every time with the understanding that it might take a long time to get there, but you're not in a rush because if you were in a rush, you're doing yourself a disservice because you wouldn't be getting all the lessons that you should be getting when you're on that journey. And if you were in a rush and you suddenly got that thing that you wanted to get, you wouldn't really in your heart feel like you deserved it because you didn't work for it. And I think when you really work for things over time, and I don't know if that sounds a bit romantic, but you, you feel it, you understand it, you know why you got there, you don't have to question it. And then it, I think organically that leads you into the next thing that you should be walking into or that you naturally or organically uh, kind of want as a natural progression. No, this is the if game is, I think we all played that out in our lives at one point. Um, but going back to, so you're in New York now and you have this plan. You understand what you want to accomplish or what you want to do. At what point did you feel that you had a breakthrough? You feel like, okay, this is happening now for me. What was the project, the collaboration that was a, a big affirmation? the your goals and dreams you're in the right path i think some people have had that experience where they've had one project or one experience that has shown them that they're on the right path and has shown them that they made it or they're making it i don't think i've ever had that i think life has always been a struggle you know because even when you have uh, a project that feels like it's a success there's so much that comes with that and beyond that if you don't have the real infrastructure to keep pushing you forward. You know, I'm, I'm an independent artist, which means for most of my life, I did not have a team. Uh, and even now I have a very, very small team. Um, so, you know, the successes that I've had and, and the moments where I've grown as an artist, you realize that there's still a lot more to come with that, you know, the, the more successful, successful you are, the more people assume that you have the infrastructure and the support around you um, that you don't have. Um, and the more successful you are, the more people then want your services or your art or your time for free because you're successful. But, but for you, you're reaching these successes and now you have a studio, now you have some staff, now you have to get insurance, now you have to pay art handlers, now you have to pay um, for all these other things you never dreamed that you had to pay. Um, so you, so success in a way means that your overhead keeps growing and, and now people don't want to pay you because you're successful and you should do everything for free or for charity. Um, and, and it's funny for many years, I did all of this charity work and I, I still do a lot of charity work. Um, but then you look back and you're like, wait, I'm not actually earning any money. And, and my, my expenses are, have, have quadrupled. And now I'm doing all this free work because I'm successful. Um, and people just assume you have this infrastructure because that's what artists at that scale have. Um, and so when you have these big moments, you don't have the infrastructure to like keep that momentum going. Um, and then, so you have to like, just take all those resources into the next thing. And so, I think there's not been, for me, there's not been that one moment or one project. You know, if you, if you look at my career, it's just a lot of hard work for many years. And I still don't see myself as a successful artist because for me, what success means is that I can make what I want, when I want, wherever I want. And I'm not able to do that because of restrictions or resources or financials or space or time or infrastructure. So I still see myself as not, not a starving artist, but on some levels as a struggling artist because I'm struggling to be able to still make the things that I want to make. But you also were given uh, a lot of due to your success as well. As you mentioned, don't consider yourself a success, but you have established yourself and made a name for yourself as well with uh, draw attention to a lot of companies that want to collaborate and work with you. And I'm, just, I'm assuming that's still the case. For you, once somebody about to approach with a new project and a collaboration, what's the process? What are the things that you're looking for before you sign up to something that will take months, if not years, before you see the, uh, the fruits of it? 
Yeah, I think it's a good question. And, and, you know, as I mentioned, like, because I don't have a huge infrastructure, it means we don't have the bandwidth to do, you know, a lot of things. So it's if something does come my way, you know, it definitely it definitely is a process to see if it's something that we can do. So, for example, firstly, I'm asking myself ethically and morally, is this something that I agree with? Um, is this a brand or an institution that I can stand behind? Um, is this something that will challenge me? Is this a project where I'm able to make something that I wouldn't be able to make by myself? Is this something that I'm able to expose my work and my message to a different demographic? Is this something that I have the time and bandwidth to do? Is this something where when I sign that agreement that there is mutual indemnification, that they are not used in terms like perpetuity, which means forever and ever, um, that they are um valuing myself equally uh, as an artist and an individual so that value could come in many different ways that that could it doesn't always have to be monetary and so if i can say yes to all of those things then it, it seems like a project that i would do and and the types of companies or institutions that approach me don't all have to be you know these large legacy or you know kind of um you know, it, it, it could be it could be a little startup. It could be a small charity. It could be a multi-billion dollar company. It could be somewhere in between. It could be a science, it could be a science experiment. It could be something across the spectrum. And I've always been like that. You know, if, if something is piquing my interest, then I'm going to explore it and see if it ticks all those other boxes and it's something that I want to do. And it's funny because at first people said to me, you know, Chantelle, you can't do that. You can't work with brands. It's going to devalue your work. You can't do these academic things. It's going to devalue your work. You can't do this. It's going to devalue your work. And as a working living artist, I'm going to work on the things that I want to work on, regardless of their industry or their medium and regardless of people that just put these things in tidy little boxes that go out there telling artists what they can do or that they can't do. Um, so I think my career reflects the types of projects that I've worked on are, have been things that have really intrigued me and interest me um, that that show and tick some of those things that I mentioned that are on my list. And I think for a long time I've wanted to make a poster of all those things and I, and I probably should um, so that I can just hand that out to people and <laughs> people can add to it or subtract from it based on where they're coming from. But yeah, that's kind of my process. Well, clearly we can tell that you are someone very committed to your journey. I mean, since we started having this conversation, it is obvious that everybody can listen or watching us see that you are someone who knows who she is, someone who knows what she wants. Is that something that you develop through your history in your life, throughout all the traveling experience you had? Or were you born with that? Were you born, were you already a little girl with a little bit of like defined answers and knowing exactly what she wants to do? No, it's just street sense. You know, when you grow up uh, in an environment where everything is against you, you have to figure out like how to survive. And so I think uh, initially it's just a survival tactic of wanting not to get completely eaten, wanting to survive, wanting to progress, wanting to get better, um, eventually wanting to get to a place where it's not about survival, it's actually about living. And I think um, those things have uh, reflect themselves in the work, but also at the same time, being kind, being open, being respectful, um, setting a good example. I think being an artist, you're, you're in an industry that notoriously has celebrated horrible people doing horrible things and treating people badly because they're important. Um, and I've always believed that that is BS. And I think a lot of the baggage of the art world and the art market and the art market is BS. Um, and but people justify this BS that, you know, because of the obscene amount of money involved in it or because of the, the type of people in it come with prestige or legacy, etc. But if someone's not nice, don't hire them. If someone's not nice and they treat people like garbage, don't call them important artists and like try and justify it and then promote them and celebrate them. Um, I think, you know, I've always wanted to set a good example. And when I first moved to New York, you know, I, I, I met someone who was working with this very famous artist and, and he made her cry because he shouted at her and, 
you know, treated her like crap. And, and when I kind of talked to her a little bit more about it, he, she said, well, he talks to everyone like that, but he's an important artist. And it's so crazy to me that in this industry, in the industry of the arts, we let people behave like that. And then we celebrate them and put them in museums. And, um, you know, I think for myself, um, I've always just wanted to work hard, make work that I'm proud of, that perhaps other people will enjoy. But then at the same time, just be a kind human um, and set a good example that you can be successful in whatever sense that that means, but also be a nice human being. No, I couldn't agree more with you. For sure. Uh, Chantal, do you go back to London a lot to visit the family? Have you been able to do that recently? Um, I was just there a couple of weeks ago. Um, I went back, I got, um, I went back to get awarded. I got an honorary fellow from Central St. Martin's UAL. Um, and that was interesting. I was at the Royal Festival Hall and I invited some friends and family to come along and, and they sat them in the Royal Box, which was a nice experience. <laughs> But um, I'm usually back in England once a year, probably not more than that. Um, but, but yeah, I go, I go there. I have, as you mentioned earlier, I have five siblings and now I have 14 nieces and nephews. So I kind of want to make sure that they know what I look like as these nieces and nephews are growing up. So I, I try to go back at least once a year. Because that's what I'm curious. I want to ask my next question is that what is the relationship like now, you know, that like you have travel the world, you really have been able to find yourself in a way that you understand who you are and go back. And how do they see you? I'm sure they're very proud of you as well, but has that dynamic change? Have you had that opportunity to have this conversation with your siblings and nephews so they understand where you're coming from and who you are and how that makes you feel? I think yes and no. I think a lot of that dynamic between my siblings and I just hasn't changed, you know. Um, We also just never really speak about what I'm doing. We just speak about TV and the kids. Um, <clears throat> I think for my nieces and nephews, it's been interesting because I think one of my nieces was telling me that they were uh, teaching a Chantel Martin workshop in her school, uh, in her art class. And, and she put her hand up and said, that's my auntie. And no one believed her. Um, and, <laughs> um, and I said, why didn't they believe you? And she said, well, because I'm white and I live in a shitty part of London. And, um, you know, and, and so everyone just assumed that she was lying. And so I sent her a whole bunch of stickers to give out to everyone in the class. But, um, you know, I, I think some of them that my nieces and nephews are definitely aware of what I do because, you know, they teach Chantel workshops in, in, in schools now in, in a lot of schools here in the US and also in the UK. But I think for Uh, a lot of them, they don't really know that much about my life. You know, now the nieces and nephews are getting a bit older, so I can bring them out to visit me. You know, one of my nephews was just here just before I went to London and he came to stay with me for a week and kind of experienced my, a bit, bit of my life, so to speak. And so I think that's important for me, for them to come out and visit me and have a different experience outside of the UK, outside of London, outside of the place that I grew up in, that they're growing up in and getting to know me and I get to know them in, in that environment, kind of in my space. And so that's been really fun getting to know my nieces and nephews as they're turning into adults. But um, when I go back there to England where, yeah, we, where it's very, you know, we're not talking about all the things I'm doing. We just literally talk about the children and what's on TV. So now you're in LA, brand new city, enjoying yourself, enjoying nice weather, a contrary of us over here. Um, what, what, you, what is next for you? Would you, there's any big project that you're working on or something that you want to focus? Yeah, I'm, I'm furthering the, the shows that I mentioned called Present Word. So I'm working on those. Uh, very recently, I released Chantel Sands, which is uh, a typeface based on my handwriting. So that's an open uh, source font that you can find in Google Docs or um, online. So, you know, I, I'm working more on Chantel Sands and, and trying to see where that goes out in the world. So everyone go to ChantelSands.com. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'm just making granola, walking along the beach. Um, and you know working towards a couple of future shows so probably one here in LA and, and one there in New York. 
Chantel, before I let you go, there's three questions I ask everybody. And we want you to recommend us a book to read, uh, something to watch, or could be a movie, a TV show, something currently, or one of your favorites, doesn't really matter. And who do you think we should have here in the podcast next? So I, uh, I think you should go read... I've not finished it yet, but I'm currently reading tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. You're going to have to fact check this after but this, but it's called Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Tomorrow by Gabrielle Someone. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you'll let everyone know what that is. And then go and watch Star Trek. Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. You know, if you've never seen Star Trek, go watch uh, Star Trek Generations. Um, if you have seen it, you know, just go rewatch some of your favorite ones. Um, and the last question was, what was the last one? Who do you think we should invite to be a guest in the podcast? Um, I, I've got a, probably, I don't know, a few people. I think the friend that jumps to mind is, is probably someone called, uh, Juan Marin. We've, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of drawing dates together where we would meet up and hang out and draw together and, and play music. And, um, he's out there in Brooklyn. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see or hear what he would have to say. But, um, but yeah, other than that, you know, everyone go out for a walk, get off line. Um, yeah, go read a book or watch Star Trek. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Chantel, I really appreciate having the time uh, to get to know you a little bit better. You know, open up here and let us kind of get into a new world and, and being able to understand and what the artists in the art as well. So uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And I feel like I don't really know much about you. So, you know, perhaps that's another conversation in the future where you uh, you can tell me more about where you're coming from as well. Yeah, well, we'll do this. I'll come, I'll, I'm actually in LA quite often. I come down to LA, grab some granola, and then we can have okay. that conversation. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, have All a right. beautiful rest of your day. You too. Cheers. Ciao. Submission for the Creator Design Awards are now open. Visit creatordesignawards.com to find out more. Experience the world of art, design, and culture through Minded Podcast. Engage with groundbreaking artists, visionary designers, and cultural influencers and delve into their creative processes. Minded Podcast, powered by the CDA. New episodes every Tuesday.